we are underway. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, Good morning. Nice to see you all. And as I said, I've got the mute button on just so that our audio quality is good. And if you want to ask a question or join in with a comment, um, just unmute yourself um, and, and fire away. As we get underway, we're, we're closing out with the last two verses in chapter six. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to cover verses 47 through 49. And then we're going to jump into chapter seven today. Like always, um, these classes and studies are recorded. They're posted as now a video on our YouTube channel, but they're also posted as an audio file, both on Ancient Faith Radio and on uh, St. Spirit on's website. On Ancient Faith Radio, it's found under Transforming Our Lives in Christ. And, and here at St. Spirit on's, if you go to our main page and you go to the media button, it's in our podcast archive, just as the Gospel of Luke. So we've had over 100 lessons and we're in chapter six. So if I, if my mask correct, 100 lessons per six chapters, 24 chapters, we should get to 400 lessons by the time we're done. And uh, actually, I hope not. Um, Perhaps I could get through the next six chapters in less than 100 lessons. But as we get going, just a couple of uh, quick notes for all of you. I did send out an email to the entire Bible study about meeting in person. And I only got a couple of people who said that they would like to start doing that. Most said that they enjoy just still the audio format and the safety of being uh, in their offices or homes. So we'll keep our format uh, strictly online for the time being. Um, all right, we're going to start with uh, a prayer. Um, and if you, again, don't have this prayer to start your study, you can email me um, and I'll send you the PDF. Nothing too fancy. It's just simply a couple of psalms and a prayer for enlightenment. Today, I'm going to offer the psalm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous precepts. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Amen. Um, again, if you want these prayers, just uh, email me and I'll send them to you. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's jump in. And again, uh, hopefully you've got your Bibles open. Uh, Luke chapter 6, last three verses, 47 through 49. And if you've got a question, just interrupt me. We've read through this passage, as is our custom. Um, but since it's been a week, let's just refresh our memories. Um, I'm going to read these last three verses one more time. We're on a section about hypocrisy. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose the steam and the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Okay, so we're going to take all three of these verses together. They're connected, um, but we'll comment as we go. So verse 47, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Um, the verse takes into account that there's this whole multitude that showed up to um, hear Jesus speak. And if we go back to verse 20, which sort of is that transition verse that leads us into uh, the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, if we read there, we see, Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, And remember, 
Here, the word disciples does not mean just the 12. It means the 12 plus all the people who have showed up to hear Jesus speak. And there's a great crowd. Remember, he's standing kind of as the mountain comes down and there's a plain before him and he's speaking to this great crowd. And we're going to look at another transition verse. That's verse 27. Um, we know that after he gives his beatitudes and woes, he says, but I say to you who hear, and we know that the Greek is a little more emphatic. It says, but I say to you who are listening. Okay. So with these two verses in mind, we should read verse 47. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them. Uh, in other words, these people have shown up to hear Jesus speak. Are they listening to him? Now, stop and realize that Luke obviously is writing this, and he knows that there are no crowds right now. And so who's he speaking to? Well, obviously he's speaking to us. If you've come to this part of the text, in other words, Luke's saying, if you've read what I just recorded, okay, that means you've come to me, and have you heard what I've said? Okay, now are you willing to do it? Um, and if so, then I'm going to give you an example of what type of person you are, okay? Um, you guys understand that? So it, it should be read with the backdrop of verse 20 and 27. So then he goes on. So the man who listens and does what Jesus uh, is, is asking him um, is like someone who builds a house that's laid its foundation on the rock. So that should be a play uh, on things that you should na naturally pick up. What is the foundation? Easy answer. Christ, right? And um, he is the cornerstone. And we'll, we, we hear in another place in the scriptures how it's this cornerstone, Jesus Christ, whom others reject, right, to their own ruin. And so Jesus is suggesting the same thing here. If you wish to really build your house, then you've got to lay it on, the, on me. And, and from there, your house can go up. And um, just a side story. So we, we built our new church two years ago. And during the construction process, we found out that the original building did not have a foundation. And so what was happening prior to our reconstruction was simply the weight of the roof upon the cinder block walls was holding everything in place. An incredibly dangerous situation, which existed for over 30 years. So when we encountered it, the builder immediately said, well, when we didn't know it, you know, no harm, no foul. But now that we know it, we can't continue in the project until we solve this foundation problem. So one of the ways that we solved it was that we basically had to drive pylons through the existing walls and set footings and stabilize the building, okay? And the danger, of course, was that if at some point somebody accidentally drove a car into the side of the building, we got a terrible windstorm or a flash flood that hit the side of the building, what would happen to the building? It would collapse. Well, the same thing is going to happen to us spiritually. If our foundation is somehow set upon maybe our own set of beliefs, our own uh, activity, um, or even a false set of teachings, what Christ is warning us, if they somehow differ from what I've told you and what I've presented to you, you're not going to make it. Okay? You're going to be like those in verse 49 who set their house on um, no foundation. And, and when trouble comes, um, there will be ruin, okay? Um, all right, La last kind of comments. You know, these last verses close out the sermon uh, on the plane. And once again, Jesus sort of points out, look, I've given you a way to live. And 
I hope that you'll take it. And it's a distinct way of life. And if you don't take my advice, I, 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 well, I'm warning you, life will be, a, will be a mess for you. All right, any questions as we closed out chapter six? Just a comment, uh, Father, just saw where it says, um, he is like a man building a house who dug deep, uh, as opposed to the other one who did not dig deep. And yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's hard work, right? I mean, we gotta, <laughs> yeah, I, there's gotta a, do the work. There's a young boy in our parish who uh, their parents live on, on acreage. And his father told him, I, I want to build a root cellar. So he said, you're going to dig the hole. So he dug a little, you know, one by two foot hole. And his dad was like, no, uh, keep going. And so for months now, his son has been digging, right? Because he wants it 10 feet deep and 12 feet wide. Um, yeah, it takes a lot of work. David, I'm going to see if you can pick up on something, though. Um, where else do we find a story about a shallow... Uh, um, a shallowness to spiritual life. It might, it's, it's, it's a parable. Well, I'm thinking about the parable of a sower. Yeah, you're on it. So do you, do you recall uh, in that parable, it's, you can find it easily in Matthew 13. You guys remember I've told you and taught you that that's a compendium, right, of parables. So we, if we go back, we find um, all these parables, right? So let's, let's pull this up for a second because your point is well made and we should look at something really quick. Verse 3 of chapter 13. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Beholder, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and, and he sows his seed on, on, on different types of ground, right? Um, and then he gives them an explanation of what this means in verse 18 and following. So you have, to, you have to page forward to get to it. And I want you to go particularly to verses 20 and 21. But he who received the seed, now, what is the seed? It is the teachings of Jesus Christ, which we've just received in Luke 6, okay? He received the seed on stony places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has, verse 21, no root in himself, but endures only for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles or he falls, right? Okay, how similar is what Jesus says in verse 47 through 49 to this? It's, it's almost identical, right? In order... For the seed, the teaching of Christ to take uh, hold in our lives, it has to go deep, right? Can't remain on the surface. So it has to take root. Um, and, and the way to test that is when tribulation comes. So when the stream beats vehemently, is there a foundation? Now, okay, let's, let's go on another tangent. How can you test yourself when there has not been an external trial? How does the church test whether or not there is a foundation without an external trial? Bonnie? That's why we have prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Yes. Ta -da. <laughs> Ta -da, thank you. Well, a shameless plug again, I guess. So here's the book. <laughs> um, Toolkit for Spiritual Growth, A Practical Guide to Prayer, Fasting, and Almsgiving. No, but actually I wrote this down because that's how we press it, press down into that foundation. Yes, yes. If no trial comes, no worries, we self-apply the trial. Prayer, fasting, and the giving of alms is self-imposed trial and tribulation. I'm meeting with the new catechumen, and um, I stopped kind of doing the general classes for catechumens because I found that most people need a little bit more individual instruction. I don't know how much longer I can sustain that, but this young person said to me, um, now, 
we're, we've gotten to the point of spiritual disciplines. And so we're talking about fasting. And she says, now help me out here. She goes, I don't really quite get fasting because it's this spiritual discipline. But all I find is that when I fast, I just get angry. And I said, exactly. Because if we were to literally just make sure every meal satiated us, that we got plenty of rest, um, then we might think our virtue is real when really all it is is that you're well fed and well rested. You know what I'm talking about? You're kind of fat, dumb, and happy. So you think, yeah, I'm kind and nice. And if it weren't for, you know, those times where I get hangry, you know, hungry and angry, uh, or those times where my kids just ticked me off, or my spouse wasn't especially um, helpful, I'd be, I'd be a saint, you know? And I've heard a lot of moms and, and dads and spouses speak this way, you know? Um, one man told me, you know, my wife was really a lovely person until we had children. And I was like, I can't believe you're saying this. And he said, you know, she was not a screamer. Um, she, she didn't get angry. She was gentle and kind. And now these children have driven her crazy. Well, prayer and fasting and almsgiving is an opportunity for us to see if the stream will knock down our house. Now, we often have the stream of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, along with loss of work, uh, sick children, um, upheaval in the economy or the world, and they run concurrently, okay? And how do you deal with it? Well, I'll tell you how most people deal with it. Does anybody want to guess? How do, you, how do most people deal with the storms? Kathy, are you trying to unmute yourself or are you just moving your camera? All right, you do things like drink. Um, you legalize marijuana. You open casinos. Um, you basically try to distract yourself from the pain you're feeling. And that, David, is a desire not to dig deep, right? We just don't want to do the work. So we stay on the surface and we distract ourselves, okay? All right, should we move on? Uh, one other quick comment, uh, yeah. Father. Um, he says, um, um, uh, who dug deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And I'm wondering, you know, what is the Greek word there? The rock? Uh, it, uh, because I mean, Simon Peter, yeah. was the rock, right? And I know that a lot of times that um, Roman Catholics look at uh, things like this and they think that, well, the church is built on Peter or Peter is the head of the church type of thing. Right. I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Peter is called the rock. We, we should acknowledge that. The Lord is also understood as the rock, right? The foundation, the cornerstone. Um, here, this would certainly refer to Christ himself. Now, when Peter is referred to as the rock, this is something we talked about way back when we studied Matthew, we should understand that it's the confession that Peter makes that is the rock, that Christ is Lord. And that's the foundation upon which the church is established, right? And so... This is a, a discussion that Catholics and Orthodox continue to have. Um, and to be honest with you and to be fair, I think both sides are coming to a greater appreciation of what each side is saying when, when each side is defending its position. And there actually has been movement, David, towards one another. Uh, the two sides are not so entrenched. The Orthodox have said more and more, yes, Peter has a special place. And the Catholics have said more and more, yes, and Peter is not alone in that special place, that the confession of faith of the faithful, of the apostles, right? So good, good, good clarification and good question. All right, anything else?
Right. I, just, I, was, I was just thinking how the whole, what you read is all set up by verse 46. It says, you know, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Yes. And, okay. and then, then he tells the story. So it's like, yeah. so, so contrary for people to call themselves Christians or yeah. or the faithful or what, what have you, and but they, they, they neglect to do the, the, the follow the law, follow, follow the, the good law. Yeah, Mark, yes. Last week when we were talking about that, I, I mentioned that for me personally, every time I read that verse, it's, it, I, feel can, I feel a level of self-condemnation. Which is, which is, I think, a healthy position for all of us to realize there are many things that the Lord has asked me to do, and though I confess him as my Lord, I don't do them. And um, this falls in line with what uh, St. Paul says later when he says, you man who condemn your brother, do you do the same things, you know? And, and the answer is obviously, yeah, I do. You know, when, when you uh, condemn another, you know, that one finger, there's, right, they say uh, three pointing back at you. So, exactly. All right, chapter seven. So, so as, we, as we move into chapter seven, um, let me again give you a context um, for where we are. Um, I had this up and I, I made a mistake before I started class, and I took down the map, um, map of Jesus's ministry. So I'm going to pull it back up, and I'm going to share the map with you, so you can all kind of look at what I'm looking at. And so I'm going to share a screen here in just a second. I had to pull it up. Uh, in your study Bibles, you probably have one as well, but we'll share the screen. And uh, thumbs up if you got the map in front of you now. Okay, so when we're looking at this map, we, we have to remember that we're in the portion of Jesus's Galilean ministry. So I'm, I'm moving my cursor around this part of Galilee, okay? You see here the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River moving down the middle. Way down here is Jerusalem, see it? Bethany. It's a pretty big journey. But we're, we're up here okay, in Galilee. And as we move into chapter 7, we're going to stay in Galilee. And we're going to stay in Galilee all the way to chapter 9. And then we're going to move. Okay? Now, we've been in Galilee since chapter 4. Um, Jesus was baptized, if you'll recall. And he goes into the wilderness in the first uh, part of chapter 4, we then transition out of his temptation in the wilderness to his ministry in Galilee, okay? And one of the centers, right here you see it, um, if you can read that, Capernaum or Capernaum, this is kind of a center of Jesus's ministry, and we're going we're gonna to be in this city again. Um, so just, just, just as a, a sense of orienting yourself as to where we are and what's going on, we're in the Galilean part of his ministry, okay? So I'm going to stop the share. Any questions? No, okay. So chapter 7, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty easy chapter compared to 6. I mean, like, I have to tell you that when I'm doing my study and I'm writing my notes, I go, whew, I got through the sermon on the plane. I almost feel like we should take, like, a two-month holiday, because chapter 7 is a whole lot easier to sort through. Um, as we look at it, it's a simple chapter. There's only four stories. That's it. Now, back up with me for a moment. Luke's gospel is a synoptic gospel. What are the other two? Matthew and Mark. Okay. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke follow the same synopsis. They have the same outline, the same kind of general set of stories and timeline. John is not a synoptic gospel, completely different, okay? Now, if you recall a hundred lessons ago, we talked about source material for Luke's gospel. We said as Luke was writing, remember Luke is not a 
direct disciple of Jesus. The only direct disciples who wrote Gospels are Matthew and John, right? Luke is a disciple of whom? Well, of course, of Christ. He's one of the 70. He, he made the journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus with Cleopas, but he's part of the group that really comes into the ministry through Paul, right? You guys with me? Now, as source material, as Luke's writing his gospel, remember, if we look way back to how he starts his gospel, he says in verse 1, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative. So Luke's aware of other attempts, and he is going to do one himself. And just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account. So this is the great narrator, right? He's telling us his story. And what happens in, in chapter 7 is Luke now steps on his own as a narrator, and he's going to use his source material in a unique way. And he's going to introduce stories that no one else has. So remember, <clears throat> in Mark's gospel, you don't find anything that you won't find in Matthew and Luke. Right? In Matthew's gospel, you find plenty you find in Mark and Luke, and some things you only find in Matthew. And in Luke's gospel, you find plenty of things you find in Mark and Matthew, but things that you only find in Luke. And one of the most famous stories of Luke that we don't have anywhere else is the prodigal son. Right? We all know the prodigal son story, and only Luke gives it to us. Now, as we look at the outline for chapter 7, four stories. A centurion, a widow, a story about John and his disciples and Jesus' response, and then a story about the forgiveness of a woman. Of the four stories, Two of them are, are unique to Luke. The raising of the widow of Nain's son, okay? And the story of the forgiveness of a woman who is in sin. Those are unique stories to Luke. Now, at the same time, Luke's going to handle the story of the centurion and the story of John the Baptist and his messengers and Jesus differently than Matthew does, okay? Because if you, if you have a study Bible, you'll find the location of this story of the centurion in Matthew. You'll see it's in Matthew chapter 8. And you'll find the story of Jesus' encounter with the messengers of John the Baptist in Matthew 11. But if you put them side by side, they don't handle the material identically. And they don't make, if you will, identical points, much like what we found in chapter 6 with Jesus' words that are also found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Remember, Matthew handles the, the content differently. Th this is always important to us because, you know, I've had people say to me, well, why don't we just sort of summarize Matthew, Mark, and Luke? And in fact, if you recall, when we talked about the canon, that was what some early Christians attempted to do, right? They just sort of like said, well, let's just do a mashup, right? And the church rejected that attempt, right? And said, no, 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 no. There is something unique about Luke. There's something unique about Mark, right? As we went through Mark, we saw many things that Mark's doing that are different than Matthew and different than Luke. Okay, so how, how do we break up this chapter? Verses 1 through 10 is the centurion and faith. Um, probably not any different than your study Bibles. Some study Bibles uh, and some commentaries combine verses 1 through 10 with verses 11 through 17. We're going to handle them differently. The widow of Nain and the resurrection of her son, verses 11 through 17. And we're simply going to note while these two stories are very much connected, Luke's making similar points in both stories, they are different 
or important enough that we should separate them. Okay. Um, third component of Luke chapter seven is verses eighteen through thirty-five. Um, and here I'm going to call this the forerunner and his messengers, and Jesus' commentary on John. And then the last story from verses 36 through the end of the chapter is a sinful woman forgiven. Okay, any questions about context or outline or Luke's difference in handling the material at this time? Okay, well, we'll move on. All right, so this first story of the centurion and faith uh, is a very well-known and memorable story. I think a lot of people who are familiar with the New Testament recall this story. And the telling of the event gives Luke an opportunity to emphasize some important themes for him and his gospel. Going back to when we introduced the Gospel of Luke, we said one of the things that Luke is, in, is, in, 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 is emphatic about is that, remember, some people, by, by the reading of Luke's Gospel, we know that some people have read and understood and come, if you will, to faith in Jesus Christ and now have their, their doubts, right? They're starting to go, I don't know if this really is the Messiah. And Luke wants to make the point that God did indeed visit his people through Jesus. He is the promised Messiah and the prophet of God. Okay. The second thing that we know that Luke wants to do is he wants to, to make the point and provide the perspective that Jesus is not just for the Jews or a select group of people, but rather he is a Messiah for all people, for the nations. This is not thematic only to Luke. It's found in Isaiah. It's found in Jeremiah. I mean, it's found within the Old Testament for sure. Um, but it's a point that not only the people of Israel have a hard time <laughs> uh, believing and agreeing to, it's a point that we have a hard time believing, right? We always want to marginalize the gospel for ourselves and marginalize those outside the gospel, right? So when I was a kid in the very parochial setting that I grew up in, when someone said that Jesus was a Jew, there was someone in the room who said, you're kidding me, I thought he was Greek, right? And I know that that story that I'm telling about being Greek is repeated in many circles. I thought he was a Republican. You know, I thought he was German, right? We all do the same thing. We get myopic. And it was happening in Luke's day. People wanted to claim this story only for a select group of people. And that is nothing but heresy. In fact, declared by the church as heresy. Literally declared. It is heretical to think that Jesus Christ came for only some He's come for all people, okay? And uh, I, I come up against this constantly in my pastoral work, okay? It, it finds its way into our thinking in insidious and small ways, okay? So does the previous point that Luke's trying to make, that maybe, maybe Jesus isn't the Messiah. Maybe there are other people that we can place on par with Christ, you know? I, certainly Christ was special. He was unique. Jesus was this incredible prophet and, and sayer and miracle worker, but not unique. You know, we've got others that we should consider. Buddha, um, perhaps Aristotle, uh, perhaps uh, Muhammad, right? And, and Luke saying, no, 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 no. Unique in history. No other person ever walked the earth that was indeed God's singular prophet and Messiah. Okay. So the story's outline, uh, before we read it, is pretty straightforward. There's a Gentile that's uh, a non-Jew. He happens to be a Roman centurion, and he has a sick servant. 
and he asks Jewish elders to request from Jesus a healing. Now, keep in mind, Jesus has been in Galilee. Word's gotten out. There's this man, Jesus, who may be the Messiah, and he seems to be doing what the Messiah does. And if we just go back two chapters, go with me really quick to chapter 5. We read about the cleansing of a leper, right? We read about the healing of a paralytic. And those stories, those events happened in Galilee. And so word is out. But I, I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. I want you to look really quickly um, back to chapter 4 even. And I want you to go to verse 31. Remember, Jesus is uh, baptized. He's gone into the wilderness, and then he goes into the Galilee to, to, to do his ministry. And in verse 31, it says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And there was a demon-possessed person, right? Um, We'll look at verse 1 of chapter 7. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. So, yes, he's been working in Galilee, but he's been working in Capernaum. And so this centurion who's in Capernaum, it's, it's gotten out. He, he's heard of Jesus, all right? So he, he sends elders, uh, and they ask of Jesus a healing, and Jesus agrees. And while he's on his way, he encounters uh, uh, servants who bring a message to, to the centurion. And Jesus heals the servant, if you will, um, from afar. Okay? Now, this story, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you know, the, the doctoral award here now. Where in the Old Testament do we hear this story? Sorry to put you on the, 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 I, I had the, the benefit of, of reading and thinking about this. There's a similar story in the Old Testament. It's of a commander of the Syrian army. Is anybody remembering yet? The story of Naaman, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's healed by Elisha, Elijah's successor, right? And the story, we're going to read the story because we should, because you're going to see elements in the story that are similar to this story. But the story comes to us, if you're using a Masoretic text, most of you probably have a Masoretic, you're going to find it in Second Kingdoms, chapter 5. If you're using a Septuagint text, it's in Fourth Kingdoms, okay? So I'm going to read it out of the Septuagint, because that's what I have. And we're in chapter 5, okay? Chapter 5 of uh, Fourth Kingdoms, verses 1 through 14. Is anybody else there? Philip, you're there. Philip, would you read it for me? Just because it give me a, a break with my voice. Sure. W which verses? Uh, 1 through 14. So let's read the whole story. I'm reading out of the, the OSB. It says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord gave victory to Syria. The man was mighty in strength and valor, but a leper. And the Syrians, lightly armed, had gone out on raids and brought back captive a young girl from the lands of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet of God in uh, Samaria, for he would expel his leprosy from him. And she went in and told her master, saying, This is what the girl from the land of Israel said. Then the king of Syria said to Naaman, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand gold shekels, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I am sending Naaman my servant to you, so that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, 
When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God, able to kill and make alive, to heal this man of his leprosy that uh, this man sends to me? You perceive and see that this man is using this as a pretext for a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent notice to the king, saying, Why have you turn, torn your clothes? Let Naaman come to me, and he shall know there is a prophet in Israel. When, then Naaman went with his horses and chariot and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and bathe in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away, saying, Indeed, I told myself that Elisha would come out and greet me, that he would stand and call on the name of his God, and that he would put his hand upon the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Can I not bathe in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Then his servants approached and said to him, If the prophet were to tell you to do something great, would you not complete it? But here the prophet said to you, bathe and be clean. So Naaman went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to Elisha's instruction. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was cleansed. Thanks, Philip. It's a great reading of the story. It's a great story, <laughs> and it's a backdrop for this story. Um, obviously, it's not an exact match, but what is Elisha? He is the prophet of God, and those outside of Israel, particularly a soldier, uh, a, a general, will come to acknowledge the prophet of God in Israel, and he will receive a healing through him. And we even find within the story that within the household of Naaman is an Israelite, the young girl, right? And she, in fact, um, tells uh, or beseeches Naaman to, to go see the prophet, to be healed, which is similar to the elders uh, who, are, who are in the story of the centurion, who go on behalf of the centurion. We also see messengers, right? That, that the two never encounter each other personally, right? Um, but instead, there's this distance between the healer and the one who receives healing. Again, not an exact match. Now, what else did Elisha do? Besides this, there was, there's many stories with Elisha, but I want you to think in terms of Luke's context of what's coming and, and some of the things that Elisha did. What else did Elisha do? What other wonders did Elisha work? Doesn't he resurrect a, a yes. widow's son? There you go. Okay, so what are you going to read next? Okay, have you ever put the two together before? There it is. Okay, remember that within Orthodoxy, the Old Testament is, and don't get freaked out, is less than the New Testament. There's a hierarchy to Scripture. Scripture, the New Testament, is primary. How do, how do we represent this? On the altar in the sanctuary is placed the gospel. But not all of the stories from the gospel, only the central and key stories from the gospel, and they're on the altar, okay? When is the gospel read? It is read by the clergy, preceded by the Alleluia in the liturgy. Where's the epistle? Where's the Old Testament? not on the altar, over on the side, at the reader stand, read not by the clergy, but by the people of God. So the church has placed hierarchy. What Luke is doing is the same thing. He's saying, you got Elisha, and he did these things, but now the capstone is Jesus Christ. He's the true prophet, the prophet of prophets, right? And he's going to do wonders and signs just as Elisha did, right? He's going to heal, and he's going to raise from the dead, okay? So it's, it's just something to be aware of, okay? Um, any questions? 
comments? We're okay? Everybody's all right? Okay. I, I, I saw something. Yes, Mark. Um, so this Nathan, the story of Nathan, Nathan. <clears throat> he, uh, he didn't necessarily believe the prophet Elijah, and he, he was disgruntled. And correct, but but the is is servant of mine just well, just do what he says. Yes, and a little while ago we we're saying you call me Lord, Lord, do what yes. I say. Yes, and so it's also also like God's like in our church, he, he comes down and we go up to receive communion. So he came down to Nathan. He didn't believe, but just do these steps, and I'll heal you. And, and Nathan stepped up and did those steps. Yes, the story of Naaman is also a story of faith because Naaman ends up doing something that he didn't really think would be effective. And in a sense, he had been enraged about, like, why did I come all this way? I could have stayed home. There's bigger, better rivers that back home. But the messengers tell him, and again, if we take this story and put it within that sort of uh, metaphorical or symbolic framework, which the church fathers were happy to do all the time, they would say, yeah, sometimes the messengers of God come to us and they tell us to do something and we go, that doesn't make any sense. It's not going to work. And, and yet the, the messenger of God says, no, just, just trust. God will do what he has promised to do, but you just have to listen and do it. It's similar to what we would tell our children. You know, uh, yesterday, my youngest uh, spirit on didn't want to pick up the kitchen table after dinner. So he was having a hard time with, with the fact that that was his chore. So I, I just took him aside and I said, sweetheart, are you struggling? He goes, yeah, I don't get it. Why do I have to do it? <laughs> well, how, how are you going to explain to a, you know, a nine-year-old, you know, the whole mechanism of running a household at this point? It's not going to happen. So I didn't attempt. I just said, sweetheart, right now, you know, we want, we want you <laughs> To, to clean, you know, clear the table. And it's, it's the chore that we've given you. And when you get older, you'll see the point of it. Now, not too much later, uh, the 15 year old didn't understand why she had emptied the trash in her bathroom, which had fallen over, right? And trash was all over the floor. And she said, I don't understand why it bothers you. You don't use my bathroom, right? Any other parent had this kind of conversation <laughs> with the teenager? <laughs> Right? They happen all the time. So I said to her, well, sweet Eleni, um, you know, trash on the floor is, is really just not okay. So, you know, just put it in the trash can and, and take it outside. She said, well, when I have my house, I am not going to care about such things. Which is not true, right? <laughs> right? So at least you're, you're emerging into adult life. Have you made the transition? Oh, yeah. So I used, to, I used to be like, I'll never keep things as clean as my mom does. And then here I am and I do. <laughs> right. Uh, so Mark, to your point, yeah, sometimes God is asking us to do things and we don't quite understand the purpose or the point. All right, let's read, let's read uh, through An uh, Andy. Uh, why don't you uh, unmute yourself? And if you'll read verses one through 10. I do. <clears throat> Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying, The one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not too not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. 
amazing story. Thanks. The reading of it is fantastic. I just, you know, as you're, as you're looking and following along in the Greek, it reads beautifully in the English as well. Um, there are a couple of things in the Greek that are emphasized that don't quite come out in English, but we'll, we'll get to those as we go. Um, but what a beautiful story, you know. So let's, let's, let's begin our exploration of the story um, as we normally do by just kind of going verse uh, by verse, okay? So let's start in verse one. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. By now, you should be used to Luke's narrative style. And as he transitions us, right, he's moving us from one set of uh, teachings and things to consider to another. And, and we know, you know, well, we, we were just in the sermon of the, of the plane. And so Jesus finishes it. Um, and it's a very kind of Jewish uh, saying. Uh, the words of him, you know, all the words of him. But nonetheless, he uses this phrasing, a Semitic phrasing, and he enters Capernaum. Um, the verse is, it kind of smooths out the narrative. And we've already pointed out Capernaum is just on that north part of the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of, uh, the, the Lake of Galilee, right? Now, I showed you already that we've been in Capernaum with Jesus in, in chapter 4. So we, we know that Jesus has already been in Capernaum. He healed the demon-possessed man. If you go to chapter 5, verse 17, the healing of the, of the paralyzed man, nowhere in here does it say it's Capernaum, but it does in Mark. So in Mark chapter 2, we know that this healing of, we know that it's, he's in Galilee, but but he's particularly, specifically in Capernaum. So he, he's, he's healed a demon-possessed man. He's healed a paralytic. And now he's going to deal with a sick slave of a centurion. Okay? V verse 2. And a certain centurion servant. That, that's interesting to note. Um, it doesn't just say a centurion servant. It's a certain centurion. Um, <laughs> how many centurions are there in, in the Gospels? I, I did read one commentary that, that locates, I think, seven. But off the top of my head, I can think of, of three for sure. This centurion in... in Luke chapter 7, the centurion Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So if you just page forward to Acts chapter 10, we encounter a centurion in verse 1. His name's Cornelius. And remember, he calls for Peter to come to his house, that centurion. So there was a certain man in Caesarea called it's Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. He, he appears again in verse uh, 22. And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. This centurion has a similar description to the centurion in the story in Luke, right? And a third centurion known in the church as Longinus is the centurion depicted in the icon of the crucifixion who took the spear and placed it in the side, right? And came to believe, right? So there's a third centurion. Now, in the church, come out of the New Testament now, let's go post-New post Testament. How many saints are centurions. You'd have a hard time counting them up. We have, for example, whom? Eustathios, right? We have George. We have Demetrius. We have Minas. Um, 
there are many soldier saints, so many that one of the great new children's books for Orthodox children is Warrior Saints. Boys love this book. You know, it shows them all in their swords and their, you know, and, and these men under authority, and, and we note um, St. Paul's particular example of, uh, of a soldier, right? And, and somehow the life of, of, of soldiers predispose them to hearing the gospel. And we find the reasoning in the, the centurion statements. I am a man, <laughs> right? Uh, with people under me who are in authority, right? And, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to that verse. But, but I just wanted to point out that there are centurions throughout the New Testament who have a special place in the story of Christ. Now, what is a centurion? Uh, most of us erroneously think of a centurion being over 80 soldiers. Um, I did a little historical research. That's not right. They, they probably had more around 80 that they were overseeing. They, this centurion in particular, and almost all the centurions that, that I know of, not a Jew, um, rather a Roman soldier. They were professional soldiers. Keep in mind that, that Rome had a long history of, of soldiers that were not of a professional caste. Um, but a centurion would have been a professional soldier. He held a senior staff position, meaning he had authority, he had power, he had prestige, he had means. Okay? And it's obvious from the text that this man was of some importance, too. And one of the things that we find out about him, similar to Cornelius, is that he was a God-fearer. And what this meant was that he was a type of catechumen of the Jewish faith. He was interested in the scriptures. He was studying them. Um, and he was moving towards a, a religious life that would have been like a pious Jew. You know, so you could imagine him keeping the dietary laws, uh, reading the scriptures, learning to pray, a proselyte. A pros uh, is that the right word? He, he, he was a student of, of the Jewish faith. Okay? But we know a lot more about this man than we maybe at first recognize. Um, and I'm just looking at the time and I realize I'm running out of it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick up this story next week, still in verse 2, but we're going to start with, and if you want to kind of on your own look ahead, I want you to see if you can pick out the virtues of this man um, from the story, okay? Because he has a number of them. And, and, and we have to consider that, that he would have been just, just prepared, if you will. Donna, you had a question? I'm going to unmute you. No, you're, you, you're, it go ahead, Donna. It was actually about your book. Oh, okay. What's that? Okay. Well, that go, when it goes on sale on the first, is that also going to be in e-form or just paper? Thank you for asking. So the book will be available in print only in, a, in the U.S., so you can't buy it in print overseas, um, but it will be available in the U.S. and overseas in digital and audio form. The, oh, okay. So can you purchase for somebody else and send it to them? You can, yes. Okay, you, through the um, ancientfaith.com. Yeah, okay. so ancientfaith.com is where to buy the book. It'll be available on Amazon, but... Um, it's better for ancient faith if you purchase it through them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, well, thank thanks you. For, thanks for asking. I don't know that the audio and the, the digital will be available on the same day the print becomes available. I think they always trail by like a week or so. Just a heads up there, Donna. Okay, thanks. Okay. Well, we'll yes, Nancy? Unmute yourself. Almost there. 
working on it. There do you, you read? <laughs> yeah. Do you read the um, audio book? Oh, are you a reader? I, I am. Well, they've asked that I am the reader. Uh, the audio sample was sent to the company that does that, and they'll determine whether or not that will be the case. Yeah. Oh. Um, okay, everybody, God bless. Thanks for joining us. Nice to have you, Andy, for the first time. Hope you can join us again. And uh, we'll post this recording here shortly. Thank Bye, you. everybody. God bless. Bye. 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 Bye